All righty. Well, we might kick off. Um, so good evening, everyone, and welcome to our second instalment of the four-part webinar series on all things worm management in sheep, um, organised by the Northern Tablelands Local Land Services. For those of you who missed out on last night's webinar, my name is Brianna Carney and I'm a land services officer um, based out of Armadale, but servicing the entire Northern Tablelands region. Um, many of you may have met our presenter for this evening and for the duration of the Wormwise series, Dr. Nigel Brown, who was a, is, was a district veterinarian with Northern Table and Zocal Land Services based out of Glen Innes. So thanks for joining us again this evening, Nigel. And I'm sure we're looking forward to your presentation tonight after last night's great instalment. Um, just some housekeeping before we kick off for those joining us for the first time tonight. Um, by default, Teams will have your microphone and video turned off, so you should be able to hear us, but we won't be able to hear you. Um, there is a Q&A icon in the top banner of um, Teams, um, so if you have any questions, please pop them in there as we go, and hopefully we'll have some time to address those questions at the end of the session. The webinar is also being recorded, so it should be available to you in the coming days to come back to. So without further ado, please welcome Nigel, who will be presenting on Barber's Polar Management tonight. So over to you, Nigel. Thank you very, very much indeed, Brianna. Welcome, everybody. Thanks for tuning in. So um, without further ado, we've only got sort of 20, 25 minutes and then hopefully some questions at the end. I'm just going to simply um, refresh your memory on the life cycle that we've got of this, this Barber's Pole Worm. Uh, straightforward out comes the feces out the back end of the sheep and out of the eggs hatch the larvae and we like a little bit of moisture well the eggs like a little bit of moisture and and according to all that I'm hearing this year we're on a slightly warmer than average year a slightly wetter than average year coming up in the next few months and that bodes well if you're a, a, a barber's pole worm these larvae that are hatching out they're in the grass they're in the bottom two five uh, bottom five centimeters of the grass closest to the ground so they need moisture there they need a bit of oxygen they need a bit so that's in the air and, and they need this warmth that will be uh, talking about a bit later on and as you can possibly see i've got a little note there i've, I've heard matt playford on several of his, his sort of talks and in meeting with him talking about twenty thousand larvae per kilogram dry matter because of course the sheep are grazing in close to the ground where all the these larvae are and that's only an ordinary bog standard number. Um, high, high levels can be much higher than that. And once those larvae, which, by the way, are not eating anything while they're on the ground, once they get into the sheep, that's when they bind into the tissues um, and feed on off the, the sheep itself. While they're on the ground, therefore, if the temperature is very warm, these larvae are much more active and they are burning off the energy that they got from their egg. If it's cooler, they're not burning off the energy quite so much. So within limits, they're going to last and live a little bit longer. If we move on to this next slide, we can see a couple of pickies there. We can see that's the Latin name for it. So it's known variously as Barber's Pole Worm, BPW for obvious reasons, um, or Himonchus. It, it's a its origins are actually from the tropics, which is why compared to some of our other worms, it requires warmer temperature, potentially more moisture. And if you look at that little table at the bottom, you can see that the uh, hatching temperature is above 18 degrees. Egg survival is only about five days, but it's producing vastly more eggs than pretty much any other at 10,000 eggs. It lives in the abomasum. 
and and this little pinky diagram here shows that the abomasum is the last of the the four stomachs it's the true digestive stomach and it's from there that the small intestine runs off it's important that you know the anatomy because later on we'll talk about the need for postmortems of suddenly dead animals there are males and females of this worm so if you see there, it says 20 to 30 millimetres long for the adult female and the males are 15 millimetres. It, it's, it's a blood sucker. And that's what gives us the typical barber's pole, red and white banding, uh, where the red is the blood in the guts and the white are the eggs and laying at 10,000 eggs per day, there's lots and lots of white ovarian tissue. Now, in the abomasum, you can have well over 500 adult worms. Remember, of course, only half of those are going to be laying eggs, but um, that's where we're going to be. So when the larvae get into the body, they can either go straight into developing all the way through to the egg laying adult, or they can have what we call inhibited development. And that means that they can form cysts in the lining of the abomasum. And that could be until the conditions get better in the spring or when there's lowered resistance in the U. Because a U will have the animal, the, the U will have its own resistance against the uh, against the worm because it's meeting it repeatedly just like any other sort of foreign agent but around the time of lambing and through till the weaning of the lamb the resistance within the ewe is reduced it's putting its energies into the milk to give its lambs a good start but that means that it's a beautiful time as far as the worms are concerned to be able to lay large numbers of eggs because one of the things that that resistance in worms does is to lower the egg production of the worms. I hope that makes makes sort of sense. Come back to me if there's any any questions on that one. So if we then look at this barber's pole, as I said, it's a blood sucker. If you look at this diagram here, you can see the big tooth that opens up the blood vessels. And these figures on the edge show that one adult worm will, will suck 0.05 of a mil of blood per worm per day. So if you take a thousand worms, that's 50 mils of blood a day. And, and that's you know, 5,000 eggs per gram in the feces. Now, an adult sheep has five litres of blood, give or take. So that's about 1% loss per day. Now, if you, as I'm sure you all recognise, you can get much higher levels of egg production than that, meaning you've got much more population of adult worms, they are taking four, five, six times that amount of blood every day. Net result is these sheep are becoming anemic, right? So the picture in the bottom corner, well, the middle of the bottom, shows um, some red and white adult, fe adult female barber's pole you can see them at that length with the naked eye um, and i just want you to get used to that but look at those subclinical losses subclinical means you don't even know it's going on 30 percent of your weight gains down the pan 10 percent of your wool growth 30 percent of milk production not happening and you don't even know it's happening so what is the disease well that's sudden death. You just find the poor sheep dead. If you get hold of them, you can look into their eye and you see they're pale and white here. If you're looking at them from close by, you can see this swelling. It's fluid, edema fluid under the jaw. And you know it's edema fluid rather than an abscess because if you press your finger or thumb into it, it leaves a bit of a pitting um, sort of hollow whereas if it's an abscess it's uniformly harder and also you'll get 
quite a few sheep with this sort of picture on. Also, which is difficult to show on a picture, if the animal is anemic, it means that it doesn't have the energy. It hasn't got the red blood cells to carry the oxygen. It hasn't got the oxygen for the tissues that are expending the energy for walk. So you'll find you've got a, a, a mob that's stringing out with some tired animals. They look big, but they're tired at the back of that mob when you start to move them. This is where it becomes, from my perspective, very easy or very interesting, I should say, because when you look at these signs, death, whether it's sudden or lingering, weakness, staggering because they're tired, tired, pale and anemia, swollen head, you've then got a range of other popular diseases or they're not popular but they're common enough um, that it could be so that's where you have to try and work out what disease it is that you're dealing with so sudden death we could get anthrax could be clostridia so vaccinations may not be up to date and the sudden death is generally recognized as being animals that are found dead I had a call just yesterday from a, a local chappy, a uh, fencer, not in sheep, in cattle. But he was doing some work and he came across 10 dead cattle um, lying on the ground and wanted to know what to do. So I gave him some advice and he, he followed it and contacted vets. But, but, but that's sudden death. Could be mineral deficiencies, could be parasites. There are other parasites other than Barber's pole and the gut parasites that 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 um, can cause problems. Could be something as simple as pneumonia inside, could be poisons or toxins or blood poisoning, good old septicemia. And if they're lingering, here's another list of, of possible diseases that could be causing similar signs and you know, swollen head. Is it a snake bite or so forth? So this is where I say that that your own experience, your own knowledge and doing examinations will help you to identify these sorts of things. But very often it's a question of getting into contact with LLS. And that's why I love about LLS was that we could help producers narrow down this list of possibilities. Clinical examination. We talked about the white survivors. Here's this little diagram that I commonly use. You can the pale white at the bottom here, where there's virtually no blood cells left to carry. Very weak, tired animals uh, bled to death inside. And here's a good, healthy animal. And by learning this, that gives you a strong indication. The head swelling, we talked about that. If you've got a dead animal, you can cut into it. Feces consistency. Interestingly, worms that cause diarrhea are one thing, but because the barber's pole worm is is sucking the blood these animals are actually much more likely to be constipated they certainly won't have diarrhea movements that's the lethargy i was talking about and and the weight well if you're bringing them in to weigh them you'll see that they're not moving so well and similarly condition score you'll be wanting to feel those but many of these animals will die and not appear to be a major a major uh, uh, loss of weight or condition score. So now we come through to the post-mortem and, and that's where you can get one of your local vets to, to give you some instruction on what to see or just do, cut them open as you would a killer um, and look to see what's abnormal. Take a picture, send the picky in. It will help rule out problems uh, and will sort of make the job easier. Now, fecal egg counts, usually high over, say, 10,000 eggs per gram before clinical signs are showing. And, and this is where I personally am a great believer in the fact that you can do your own sampling because you can get your results instantly. And, and here's just the, 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 the three sort of pickers to remind, and they're a bit larger, so you can see the sort of PCV levels. And a fully normal sheep is late 30s, early 40s in the percentage. 
And there's that same picture again, because we're talking about significant number of worms inside, so you can see them. But remember, these worms are going to disintegrate within a first few hours after death. So you've got to get at them fresh and, and open them up to have a good look. There's the worm egg counts that we might get. Um, it's, it's actually quite fun collecting worm egg samples. This was a student that came and saw us at Glen Innes and worked with us for a while. But when you look down the microscope, those three eggs of the barber's pole on the right, the brown stomach at the top and the black scar at the bottom look very, very similar. So you've got to interpret egg counts with a little bit of knowledge and understanding. But when I get, this is my sort of table of, of guidelines of what, um, what to do. And I mentioned yesterday that different aged animals have different abilities to uh, resistance and so forth to the effects of worms. But 500 eggs per gram is a, is a reasonable sort of starting point to know that you're going to have to do something, um, especially if you've got young animals with a barber's pole worm. Your question is, do you know whether you've got barber's pole or could it be some of these other worms that look like them but cause a different sign because of the large numbers that are produced by barber's pole worm. So it stops at 2000 and all vets, workers with worms have sort of standing stories of, of egg counts, 40,000, 50,000 eggs per gram, um, which is way outside this 2,000. Um, so again, analysis is really interesting. I make no uh, apologies at all for showing this with regard to how we can manage them. We need to be getting the genetic levels of protection up by good selection um, and and uh, to, to make certain that the ram is putting, it'll take a few years, but his genes should come through. We talked about this peri peri relaxation of resistance and that's a really important feature in sheep, not so much in cattle. We talked about the age. I'm a great believer that here in the nutrition, protein and energy, if those levels are good, then that will improve the resistance. But it seems to me a major coincidence that some of our worst levels of drench resistance in, in the Glen Innes area certainly come in areas where we also find the worst levels of selenium deficiency. And that it's well known that selenium is is needed in the production of antibodies. And regardless of whether you have selenium in your drench that you're giving, I think you have to be making certain that all your um, selenium levels are well up to date and well up in the normal range before ever you get to the barber's pole sort of time of the year. Artificially, we can, of course, introduce uh, immunity by using a vaccine only for barber's pole and it can complicate things because you then have in good better protection against the uh, barber's pole but you don't have any protection through the vaccine against say the black scour brown stomach so you're still going to need some um uh, drenching to be able to keep those under control and you have to continue to monitor your worm egg counts so that you don't ignore that. Here's a very simple diagram. Um, it needs the first three vaccines, what they call the primer vaccinations, with the first ones at landmarking, then again three to four weeks later, and a third one, not just two as we get with the Clostridia, the three, third vaccine to create effective immunity. You then need to continue with vaccines, fourth, fifth and sixth, during the season.
to be able to maintain, excuse me, the level of protection. So it's not a very long vaccine. Uh, its duration really needs that boosting, but it has been shown that it's very effective. Some, if you can get them the first time when they're lambs, that's really good. It seems to pay dividends when you're vaccinating them later on in, in life. Uh, but uh, there are some places where the responses haven't been quite as good as they might have been. I'll have to be honest with you. Let me just move on to the next slide. We've talked about grazing management uh, to some extent the other day. It's a question of preparing pastures. And because we're looking at the spring pastures where the sunlight is, is there the UVs coming through, but we could get warm, moist conditions. We want as much grass as we can get to be growing at that time of year, which is counterproductive as far as worm control is concerned. This little chart here, as it were, shows the survival on the pasture, well, down to a 90% death of those barbers pole larvae um, at different temperatures. So it's no good unless it's bare and dry in just giving them a couple of weeks break and hope that it's going to kill off the worms. Look how they, they're going to survive, even when it's cold, they're, they're going to survive four months. And of course, there's also this whole concept of refugia, which which means it's those areas where the worms can survive, even if you process the paddock and turn the pastures or put other plants down and seed it, you're still going to get these areas where some resistant worms are going to survive. And interestingly, there are people who recommend that it's actually worthwhile drenching sheep with um, totally susceptible um, worms that so that the worms that they are putting out are actually going to survive in these refugia and they're not going to have very much drench resistance so that when these animals reinfest themselves they're going to be reinfesting themselves with uh, worms that are very susceptible to to drenching so it's an interesting concept that one so our chemical worm control today, first and foremost, it's, it's improving the management. That's getting on top of the facts and the figures. It's avoiding bringing resistant worms onto the farm in the first place if you're bringing in rams, etc., by having robust quarantine. And it's it's minimising the selection for resistant worms by, by, re, by dosing accurately. Uh, Resistance comes if you don't kill the worms outright, but just wound them. Then they recover, but they're the ones that have the uh, resistance and their offspring are the resistant ones. Nowadays, we need three to four drench actives in the same drench. Uh, the days when we could use a single or maybe two uh, are unfortunately past us. We know that you need to know the drench activity on your property. Um, but that also comes both by doing a specific drench test on the different drugs available, but also in checking 14 days after you've drenched to see just how many uh, worm eggs there are coming through. This is probably the most critical aspect of it, in my opinion. And when it comes to whether you when you should move the animals after drenching them, you've got to give them that three days for those eggs that have just been laid the moment before you drench to go through the system and out of the rectum. If you drench and move an hour later, you've got two to three days worth of parasite eggs, live parasite eggs, resistant live parasite eggs dropping down onto a new paddock. Really interesting point. So 
here are the basic essentials of drenching. Um, I'll let you read through those as I just basically talk through the, those points. But here we are, 14 days after drenching is when you need to test again. And this highlights, if you can do your own um, worm egg count and get LLS or somebody to teach you how to do it, you can be right on the ball and it will help you understand what's happening on your property. Ever remembering that the most expensive drench is the one that doesn't move, doesn't work, doesn't move, he says. So my take home messages, apart from the diagram here of doing it yourself um, and contacting Parabos for more information. There are other courses um, and places where you can go. But just remember, different worms behave differently in different parts of the country because of the weather. So be careful on anything that you, you are reading uh, to make certain it's applicable to your area. And these are my take home messages for you. LLS is one of the professional services available, but get yourself right in. You're all professionals with your with this business. Get professional about it yourself. There we go. That's all I wanted to say. Thank you for listening. But I'm more than happy if there's any questions to uh, to hear from you. Thanks, Nigel. Um, yes, as Nigel said, if you have any questions, please put them in the Q&A um, section at the top of um, your screen. Um, but in the meantime, I did get a question emailed to me this afternoon from someone who couldn't attend tonight. Um, so I'm, a, I'm new to sheep and I've heard the barber's pole are known to stay dormant inside the sheep when environmental conditions are unfavourable. Does this mean they have a reduced egg output? And if so, can I rely on egg counts heading into spring? I don't want to drench unnecessarily, but don't want to be caught off guard either. No, that's exactly right. Um, when they're dormant, these, these larvae have not actually they're, they're, they're virtually embedded in cysts in the wall of the abomasum that means they are still larvae they're not adults and they are not laying eggs so monitoring the egg production is going to give you a an accurate representation of the number of adult blood sucking worms that are there the damages that is that are done to the wall of the abomasum are, uh, I won't say they're not influential later on in life, they are, but there is a fair, fair amount of healing that goes on. Uh, and the, the insisted larvae are not so numerous, I don't believe, as they are in, say, the brown stomach worm. So it's going to give you a, 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 an accurate representation, but it's one of the beauties of doing your own egg counts because you can do them much more frequently, just keep a record and even draw a little graph, which is what I like because I'm a very paper orientated visual person, to keep a graph of the record so that you can see how they're going up and how that, that monitoring every few days goes along with the change of the weather. Does that make sense? Yes, I think so. <laughs> <laughs> um, we did have another question. Um, it's about drenches. So why are long acting drenches often implicated in the development of drench resistance? So something such as Clossantel, which is, as you know, a narrow yeah. spectrum for Barber's Pole. Um, how can producers use them effectively without fast tracking resistance? Yep, I suppose the the reason for them would have to be if you look at the the dynamics of chemicals in the body, they're given and then they have a peak, uh, come to a peak, which is what the laboratory tell us. But then the body breaks down those chemicals and it, it, the chemicals don't suddenly turn around after day. Oh, I don't know, let's say day 28, and say, that's it, chaps, stop working. Um, they, it just eaters off gradually. So what is happening is that towards the end of its life expectancy in the body, the drug is not at a high enough level to kill 
worms in the body. So those worms are at that sublethal level and therefore they are surviving. And it's those ones that are not killed at that level which are spewing out eggs with their own genetics and that is why the resistance comes in more quickly when it comes to how do you manage that i suppose the most sensible way of of looking at it is to look at the various combination of drugs that there are available and have a word with the your, your advisor, be it one of the commercial sort of laboratories or the LLS that are able to look at your own specific on-farm issues. Um, I, I think the days of painting by numbers where one size fits all have, have long since gone. And I think anything that I were to say about how you overcome it could be uh, misinterpreted in certain circumstances because you've got to look at your own specific circumstances. Would you still recommend using um, a primer and an exit drench to sort of catch that tail end of any resistant worms? Yes, I, 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 I in general do do like those because you're 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 starting off at a clean point. Uh, you've got to dovetail those in with management so that again you've got to be looking at moving animals on at the right time with pasture, but using those other combinations and seeing what is the best advice to do it. Uh, is is the right way and we talked yesterday about ways of making certain that there are clean pastures but it's this finishing off that is critical and making certain that you're getting a good kill so that you've not got a whole host of of resistant animals just living in the belly while this drug is is trying to do its thing against the others well, we haven't got any more questions for tonight, and that just about brings us to the end of our time. Um, so I'd just like to thank you all for joining us tonight, um, and a big thank you again, Nigel. Um, as before, if you would like further information about any of the topics covered tonight, please don't hesitate to get in touch. Um, and also please don't forget next week, Tuesday at 6 p.m. again, we have a session on scourworm management. And the following day on Wednesday, again at 6 p.m., we'll have our last session of the series on fluke management in sheep, liver fluke management in sheep. So if you haven't registered yet, please do so. And, yeah, thanks, everyone, and we'll see you next week. Thanks so much. Yeah. Bye.